Kia ora. Welcome to this message from Hope Chapel Hamilton. We hope that this message inspires you and we pray that it brings you encouragement wherever you are in life. Stay connected. We're supporting Unashamed, which is the youth ministry that these guys lead nationally. And uh, so we'll see more of them, definitely. But as far as uh, fellowshipping here as their home church, we're sending them on. And, uh, you know, there's a great C3 church down in Hawke's Bay as well. So perhaps they'll connect down there. But would you just stretch your hands towards these guys? Let's uh, pray for them. God, we thank You for Luke and Jess Collis. Lord, we thank You for their amazing family and the call of God that is on their life. And I pray, Lord, as we send them out from this house to move down to Hawke's Bay with family, God, we thank You that the call is strong on their lives. Lord, we thank You that we get to partner with them, that we get to see a future that is bright and great for this unashamed youth ministry. Lord, that they will truly have an impact on the generation of people in New Zealand. Lord, we declare that over them. We send them with our blessing and our support. In the Name of Jesus, we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Make sure you give them a huge hug and stuff before uh, they disappear from our lives forever. No, not really. Uh, good riddance. See you later. Okay, out of my mind. Right. So so we're in this year of more and, and uh, we've been praying about this. We've been prophesying it over your lives, for your families, for your situations, your relationships, your spiritual life. We believe that God has spoken that we are to, uh, to claim and declare more for the year over our lives. The promises of God are powerful in your world. Now, let me explain. This the, the the voice of God or the promises of God is actually more powerful than your current reality or current circumstance because His voice has the power to shift things and to change things. And so we're encouraging all of us as a church to believe for more, to pray for more, to declare more. And we've seen some incredible things happen already to this moment halfway through the year. But but here's the deal: we don't just uh, because God's spoken this. It doesn't mean we're all just going to step into more. There's a part that we have to play in this as well, and we have to stay active in our faith and keep believing. And, and so this series, What Now? is very much about a catalysting this more Word of God. We, we have to ask ourselves in all areas of life, what now, God? What now? What's, what's the next thing for my life? What would you have me do now? And as we keep active and keep doing that in, dis, in discipleship, then He brings the more to our lives because we don't want to be in the same place uh, financially or spiritually or relationally or actually any area of life in 12 months from now or five years from now or 10 years from now. And I believe that these what now type questions actually have the power to influence what our life will look like in five years time and 10 years time as we make key decisions that keep stepping into what God has for us every step of the way. So just like the TV show, What Now? We're trying to drum into this into your head. What now? What now? What now? What now? Keep asking this what now key question over our lives. We have to keep moving in faith and keep growing in Christ. I love Hamish's graphic because it's this big, massive staircase. It looks unattainable, but every what now question as we step in in obedience, it takes us a step up and a step up and we, we keep moving. And I love that it's a little child because it's childlike faith of just taking the next step. And before long, we're believing that as a church, we'll be looking back in 12 months time and we are, we're made a huge way up the, the journey towards God, Christ likeness. And we're looking back at all that God God has done in our lives, but it's only going to happen as we embrace this question of what now and keep asking it and keep uh, listening to what God says in it, keep walking up the steps. That's discipleship, right? That's discipleship. So we need to ask this question, what now for my life? What do I need to grow in? What's my next step? What issue do I need to overcome next? And every time we win, every time we gain traction, we make a decision that leads us closer to Christ, then we say it again. Okay, what now, God? What now for my life? In order for me to, to see more of God in my life, immeasurably more, more than we could ask or think or imagine, what decisions do I have to make today to begin to step into that more? What now? We must keep moving. We cannot settle as a church and as a people. So hopefully my prayer is that throughout this series, we may have inspired you a bit. We might have taught you some stuff from Scripture, but more than anything, the whole aim of the series was to drum this phrase in, what now? So that we keep going wherever we find us in life, on a mountaintop, in a valley, in success, in a struggle, we just keep asking the question, what now, God? What now for my life? And then acting on it in obedience and to keep moving forward. Now, so today uh, I was praying, how are we going to close this series? Because I feel like we have drummed in this, this phrase and, you know, we could unpack some more biblical stuff or whatever, but I, I want to get really super practical with you today. Is that all right? I had some good feedback from uh, Mother's Day service when I closed the message by looking at some practical parenting tips and different things. And so I thought I'd do that today around this final week. And I, I'd encourage you to write stuff down. And I'm believing that 
that every single one of us that is in this church service this morning will be able to take some keys from today that we can directly apply to our lives starting today that will see some progress uh, come forward. I'm not actually even going to open the Bible today. <gasps> Shock, crazy, hey? Sunday morning church and the pastor's not going to open the Bible. But I did start with a Scripture, so I'm kind of covered, okay? We're all right. Ephesians 3.20, that's the word, the Scripture for today. If you're visiting with us, it's not normal not to do that, okay? We do usually use the Bible. We believe in the Bible. It's the Word of God. If you want evidence of that, just listen to our podcast, okay? Pastor Stuart gave a great message last week and he even used the Bible. So there we go. You listen to that and then think, okay, we're all doing all right. But I'm going to get real practical. Uh, See, as pastors, we see the highs and lows of life, people's lives. Those who invite us in, allow us to journey, it's a privilege, but we do see the highs and lows. We see people uh, who are successful in life. We see people who are struggling. Uh, We we get right in the mix of of it all. And sometimes we see people who are constantly, always seem to be struggling, always seem to be dealing with sin issues, maybe never really stepping into a fullness of relationship with Jesus, or or maybe it's sin in their life, or, or maybe it's just poor choices that just keep happening and we're helping and encouraging And then we see the other extreme where there's people that just seem to have an amazing, fruitful relationship with Jesus. And it's amazing, incredible. It's such a blessing to journey with those types of people. Uh, Or maybe it's those type of people that are always successful. Whatever they put their hand to, they seem to be successful in life. And and so we see both ends of the, the spectrum. But what I've figured out over the years in ministry is that usually the difference between each type of person is not usually massively great. Uh, things in life. It actually always comes down to some little things that uh, conscious decisions that people have made, habits in people's lives that lead them into fruitful relationships with Jesus and to success in life and vice versa. Little wee decisions, poor decisions, ways of looking at things that lead them down a track of destruction. And so it's so important to, to give some focus on these little things, the little disciplines, the little habits in life. And so today I'm going to address some of those things uh, in a real practical way and I would encourage all of us to write some stuff down to, to allow Holy Spirit to speak to you as I am speaking and allow Him to challenge you on some areas maybe that you need to be addressed on. I was going to call this message uh, the Proverbs of Joel and then I thought that sounds pretty much like a cult and I'm not into communes or people walking off cliffs and stuff like that okay at Hope Chapel. So I pulled back on that idea and uh, I'm just calling every point I'm talking about every simple points okay to make it real simple, real clear and real life applicable. I'm just going to unpack some of the things that I've discovered over over the years and, and I pray it's a blessing to you. So the first three, okay, the first three is this. Uh, we are actually made up of three parts, our body, our soul, and our spirit. Now you can get all theological on me and debate exactly what where the lines are and what those things are. I'm not interested in that today. But basically we are, we are made up of three parts, body, soul and spirit. So for us to have a good life, for us to be fruitful in the life that God has given us, to outwork the call of God on our life and to step into all that He's promised for us, the more of God, we have to be healthy in all three areas. Okay, body, health, soul health, and spirit health. And so for a series like this, What Now? is no good just asking what now questions about our spiritual world and not asking them about our body or about, well, we need to be asking what now about all three areas of our life, our body, our soul, and our spirit. The what now? So here's another three points. Are you ready? Three things that lead to a habit in our life, creating a habit in our life. Three simple things. Number one, to get a revelation. Number one, you need to have a revelation. Number two, you need discipline. And number three, you need consistency to see that habit formed in your life. Three things to create a habit is revelation, that you need to have the habit in the first place, right? Discipline, and consistency. And if you can apply those three things, you will go be successful in creating a habit in a small area of your life. So let's have a look at these three parts of our body in relation to uh, of our world in relation to creating habits. Number 1, healthy body habits. Healthy body habits. Now, let me just give a little disclaimer. I'm I'm not a medical doctor. Okay, I'm actually not any sort of health practitioner at all. Okay, I, I, I'm not a fitness coach. 
I'm not a nutritionist. I'm not any kind of ist, actually. Uh, uh, and so there are people like that in our church. If you want specific uh, health advice around t- uh, specific areas, then go and talk to them. They're the experts, okay? I'm not professing to be an expert, but, but one thing I do know as a pastor is, is that the fact is that there is no point in being spiritually healthy if you are not physically healthy. Let me explain that to you. If you put all your time and energy in becoming a spiritually healthy person, but you neglect the body that God has given you and that part of your whole life, then you're not gonna live in the fullness of what God has called or created you to be. So I, I'm a pastor. Maybe I could be called a life coach or whatever if, if you're not part of church. But we, we look at the holistic area of our lives, okay? Not just the spiritual side of it. I, I, about living our best life is about our body, our soul and our spirit. And so our body is vitally important. I love that this is a big deal for C3, the movement that we are part of, uh, uh, living your best life and seeing health in all areas of our world. So how do we see physical health in our bodies? How do we create healthy habits? Well, it's actually really simple. It's just about creating a habit, okay? A habit, that's it. It's not massively difficult or or tricky. Here's a key for you, listen to this, okay? You gotta get this. God is responsible for your healing, but you are responsible for your health. Let me say that again. God is responsible for your healing, but you are responsible for your health. So, so when I had cancer uh, not too long ago, it was God that hold, held and still does hold my life in His hands. Whether I was going to survive it, whether I had a good prognosis or a bad prognosis, whether I was, how long I got to live or beat it or whatever, was entirely up to God. That's, her, that's her, I had to find a faith and a trust and rest in Him that He holds my life in His hand. His healing was up to me. It was His job to heal me. It's His job to give me a good prognosis. Praise Jesus that He did. But see, I didn't get cancer because of an unhealthy lifestyle. The type of cancer so I had is completely random. They, they, they don't know it. Even if it's not random, at the very least, it's not known why, why you get it. But, but here's the deal. I got pretty knocked around by the chemotherapy, the treatment that I had. Uh, to cut a long story short, the, the fact is I, I didn't recover from this treatment like I was supposed to. And, and so it, it knocked me around a lot worse than what everyone predicted. Now, my oncologist could tell me what had happened and what I was struggling with. And he could keep testing me to, to make sure the cancer hadn't come back. And, and thank God it still hasn't come back. We're, we're continuing to believe for that. It's good statistics. But... He couldn't give me some magic pill or some formula or remedy to treat my health to get me back to 100% again. That, that he couldn't do that. There was no way they didn't know exactly what was happening, why my body was reacting the way it is. So my health, the responsibility of my health was purely on me. Okay, God was responsible for my healing and for my prognosis, but the responsibility of my health rested on me. It was my job to do everything I possibly could to get healthy again. Let me say it to you again. God is responsible for your healing, but you are responsible for your health. (coughs) I'm gonna give you another three. Here we go, here's another three. What now for our bodies? This is so simple. This is this will blow your minds, okay? How do you how do you get healthy in your bodies? Here's three things. Number one, eat well. Eat well. Number two, exercise well. Number three, rest well. Well, now all of you are thinking, well, I could do number three. That sounds pretty good to me. (laughs) No, no, you have to do number one and two first, all right? It's important to do all three of those things. It's no good just saying, yeah, I probably should eat better. Yeah, probably right. Yeah, I want to put good fuel into my body. Maybe I'll do that. Maybe I should. Or maybe you think, oh, I should get some better sleep. You know, I need to be less stressed and and make sure I go to bed early and get a good night's sleep. Or, Or maybe you think, oh, I... I've got a gym membership somewhere, you know, I need to dust off that thing somehow. I I think I'm still a member. They're still charging my credit card, so I must be a member somewhere. You know, I'm finding that gym. It's It's no good just talking about it. How about today? In the end of this What Now series, how about today say, hey, what now, God, for for these three areas of my body health, my my eating? What, what can I change now today to set a habit in place that will ensure that I am healthy in 10 years time? What, what exercise program do I need to put in place now to ensure that I'm healthy physically? What rest program do I need to put in? Remember how we form a habit, the three things, right? It's a revelation. So you need an accurate revelation of your health right now in your body. Now, if you, if you think, oh, I'm fit as, I'm awesome. How about you just go to the gym and get one of the instructors to give you a test? They'll, 
they'll tell you, they, they like to hurt those guys. Uh, I actually, when I was recovering from chemo, I went to the gym with Caleb Dobbs. Uh, he was going to help me. The trouble is he trains Olympic athletes, right? And uh, I don't know what happened in the communication, but he decided that he was going to destroy me. And uh, so I kept going and thinking, oh yeah, I'll do this or whatever. The trouble is I couldn't walk the next day. The trouble is I couldn't walk for the week following that, okay? He got fired, but anyway, that's all right. I'm not an Olympic athlete, in Jesus' name. But anyway, you get a revelation, an accurate revelation of where your health is right now in your body. Get one, it's important. Make sure you get one. And then put some discipline in place your health situation. We all can do this, right? And then bring consistency in day after day, week after week, month after month, and you will ensure your long-term health. In, in so what now? Get a revelation. Get some discipline and get consistency. This will change our health patterns. We don't want to be continuing down the same track we are over the next 12 months, the next five years, the next 10 years. It's the decisions you make now about your body health that will uh, determine what your health position will be in five or 10 years time. So I'm saying to you, church, God cares about this stuff. This is incredibly important to your life that God has given you. And so we want to see longevity in our health. So please get a revelation. Every single one of us can do that. Create some discipline. Make some key decisions today that you can set in place to ensure that you have a healthy body in the future. God is responsible for your healing. You are responsible for your health. Your body matters too, not just your spirit. Eat well, exercise well, and rest well. All right? Is that okay? Next one, healthy soul habits. Now, this is our emotional health, right? Now, we could spend months unpacking everything to do with emotional health and what the Bible says about our emotional health and how we deal with that. Obviously, we don't have time to do all of that today, but I do want to touch on our emotional health, our soul habits today. Remember, how do we create a habit? Revelation, discipline, consistency. So we need to have an accurate revelation about where our soul is at today. We need to ask the what now question about our soul. And we need to be disciplined to make the changes that we need to make to ensure and ensure a consistency to make sure that our soul is healthy in the years to come. It's no good just coming and, and say, oh, uh, my life's a mess. I'm over it. I'm ready to tap out. I'm depressed. I have all these issues going on. I'm just, I, just don't, I just don't have any fire anymore. I'm just done. That's the end result, right? But if the decisions that we can make now can solidify and make sure our soul is healthy, then we never have to tackle that hurdle down the track in life. And it creeps up on you if you're not careful. So I'm asking all of us, hey, do a little bit of a soul check today as I'm speaking. Do a soul check. Be consistent about that and continue to see it develop. Here's another three for you, okay? Here's another three things. These are just three Three areas or indicators of our soul health. Now, this is by no means an extensive list. In fact, it's only just scratching the surface. But I reckon if we can address these three areas as a bit of a check of our soul health and then make some changes around these areas, then we'll be doing a pretty good job of starting ourselves on the right journey for health, okay? Here we go. Number one is marriage and family. Number two is our hobbies. And number three is our heart. Our heart. So let's have a look at the first one, marriage and family. I'll break it down in half. So let's talk about marriage first, all right? Here we go. Who knows the saying, happy wife, happy life, okay? That could be a good one for you to write down, but let me just say this. Your soul cannot be healthy if your marriage is not healthy because your marriage is such a huge part of who you are. And so you cannot have a healthy soul if your marriage is a mess. Now, church, listen to me. I have seen far too many marriages at the point of breakdown or at the point of destruction than I would care to remember in my lifetime in the job that I do. It's heartbreaking. We we end up with the marriages that are already off the cliff, the ones that have very little hope, trying to scratch around and find some hope of some reconciliation, praying that God will do a work on people's hearts to restore marriages. It's not a fun part of our job. We're there for people, but the thing is, Here's the deal, if we can have an accurate assessment, a revelation, right, of how our marriage is right now today, then and we can put some discipline and some consistency in place around that, then it's gonna prevent ourselves getting to the point where our marriage is a mess and things are almost over, scratching around trying to find some hope in the mess. Get a revelation of where your marriage is at. Ask the Holy Spirit to give you a revelation. You know, if, uh, dealing with these couples and these situations, we found that... Uh, Most couples can look back over the last decade or two decades 
and see some consistent patterns of things where that went wrong that have led them to this moment. I'm not talking about the big mistakes like affairs or walking out or abuse or any of that sort of stuff. I'm talking about little decisions about how to communicate or not communicate, about trying to take love from the other person instead of trying to outdo them in their love that you give, about trying to live selfishly, about uh, putting priorities on other things than the marriage. Little decisions like that, little ways of looking at the other person and, and, and situations that set a pattern or a track record that that we, then you see the, the fruit of that in a decade's time or two decades time is destruction of a marriage. And so, so I am asking all of us at the end of this What Now series, those who are married, do a health check on your marriage this morning. Ask Holy Spirit to speak into that. Highlight areas and little habits and patterns. Remember, we get a revelation first. Then we put some discipline in, in place around our marriages to protect ourselves from that ongoing path. And, and then consistency to build into the healthy marriage. This is vitally important. Church, without or we can't obviously get into a whole lot of marriage counselling in a Sunday morning service, but let me just say this, this is vital to your soul health. We don't want to see more and more people in a breakdown of marriages in the church than what we already see. Sarah and I have the privilege, we're leading a hope group at the moment for young marrieds without kids. It's kind of like the place that we all want to be. You know, the, the dream of like back in the day, it's like honeymoon period, right? And, and newly married couples. And so I think that the, the couples that we're, we have, a whole number of couples actually, but they range in marriage from engaged and not married yet to a few, married a few months. And the longest uh, married couple, I think in our group is maybe a couple of years. And so these guys are very new and they're all in that, that zone where they haven't really had any major issues and problems yet, but we're getting to build into the foundation of their marriages to prevent what we usually get to see, which is on the other end or off the cliff of the marriages. And it's a huge honour and a privilege just saying, hey guys, the most important thing is setting a habit or a pattern in your marriage of small little things that'll set you up so that you're on a good track record for the future of your marriage. Because not all marriages make it and you can have the best intentions, but if you don't put them in place and in practice, then they'll end up failing. And so we've gone through a course with Craig Groeschel. He actually has four points. It doesn't fit my message of threes, but I'll put it in anyway. I can't really change his points. But so his, uh, the first one is Christ-centred marriage, okay? This is where he encourages couples to pray daily together. Every single day, pray together. Even if it's just a short prayer, grab the hands of, the, of your spouse and pray with them because it resets your heart and focus and puts God at the centre or Christ at the centre of your marriage and everything Christ at the centre. Second thing is mission-driven marriages. What I mean by this is that you're, you find a focus for your marriage that is outside of yourselves? Why has God brought you together? Why are you in this marriage? It's not just for each other, it's for a purpose and a reason. So find something that you can do as a couple that is for the benefit of somebody else. Building the church, building His kingdom, helping homeless people, whatever it is, you find a thing that you can do as a couple and that's your mission as a couple. It unites you together in spirit and purpose. So incredibly important. The next point is devil kicking. Devil kicking. This is His point is saying this, that From the moment that you get engaged, you decide to become married, the enemy would want nothing more than to destroy your marriage. He will do everything he can. He'll get his his little talons or his claws into your marriage in little, little ways, tiny little things that over time erode the foundation of your marriage. And so it's about being aware of that and pushing the enemy back at every possible chance you get as a couple, shutting the door on any sort of temptation, whether it's little or large, blocking out any distractions from your marriage that'll build into unity and saying, enemy, you will not have a foothold in my marriage. As I'm talking, I'm believing that people are grabbing a hold of this, that you're realising that there are areas in your marriage right now that the enemy has a foothold in. You've got to deal with that. What's your what now today? Deal with that foothold the enemy has and do not let him get another strength into your marriage. Devil kicking. And the last one is covenant keeping. Be covenant keeping in your marriage. Everything you do has got to fight for the vows that you gave and play it forward. If you if you mess up and things, your marriage is over, what's that going to cost you in the long run with your children and your marriage and all the things that are going to play out? And so keep that as a focus to hold on to your covenants. So that's marriage. The second part of this healthy soul habits is your family. Build and invest into your family like nothing else on earth. Listen to me, the focus of your life has got to be around your family. The fam- your family and your children are the greatest achievement you will ever have in your life. So 
Put that much priority on them. Put that much focus on them because God has gifted them to you, your children to you. And it's your responsibility to raise them up, to confess Jesus Christ as Lord of their life and to follow after Him. And so church, please don't put them as a side or as a secondary thing. You need to put a huge focus on your family, on your children. Put your time focus on them as well. They are more important than your work or your career or anything else that you're taking your time and your focus. Get a revelation of this now and put a discipline in place now and be consistent about it so that you are building your family for the future. Guys, especially, hear me, men, address this work-family balance thing that we all struggle with, okay? Your work is not as important as your family. Your family's for the long term. Your work is for temporary. Work is important. Work ethic is important, but your kids and your family matter more than your job that you have right now. Focus on your family and God will bless you with everything else that you desire. Next one, hobbies. Number three, your hobbies. This is critical. Your hobbies, you think, oh, why is he putting hobbies in there? You know, by hobbies, I mean, not like craft and stuff, unless you're into that, cross stitch. But your hobbies, hear me, your hobbies are vital. Your hobbies are critical to your long-term soul health. When we're talking to people who are struggling in life and their soul is crushed and destroyed, it's a very common thread that they don't have hobbies or things in place because your hobbies feed your soul if you have the right ones. So find a hobby that feeds your soul. What do I mean by that? Well, not all hobbies feed your soul. They might be enjoyable, but they don't fill you up. You fill your soul tank up, feed your soul. And so you've got to know and understand what actually does fill your soul, what does feed your soul and find something like that and put a plan in place. Remember, a revelation of what it is, a discipline to, to do it regularly and consistency every day, every week, put in time to feed your soul. Because if you don't, you're going to end up in five years time in 10 years time and, and even more with your soul depleted and life not making sense anymore. Now this is dependent on your personality and your interests and whatever else. Maybe you are into cross stitch or power to you, or maybe it's drinking coffee with friends or whatever. Yeah, it depends on your interests and your personality. Sarah and I are quite different people. So, so I, I have, if you like personality things, tests or whatever, I tend to find them a little bit restrictive, but, but I would have what you call a, a choleric personality type, which is, a, which is an extroverted personality type, but it's quite focused around a task or getting things done or leadership, that sort of thing. And so while I enjoy hanging out with people and socialising, that's part of my personality type, it doesn't actually feed my soul. Whereas Sarah is a sanguine type of personality where it's an extroverted plus plus, right? And so it's like that's the, the life of the party, the social, the talking relationships, all that sort of stuff. So as a couple, we enjoy socialising. We like going out, we like parties, we like hanging out with people. But the difference is one feeds, that feeds her soul, but it depletes mine even though I enjoy it. I've learned that that, that that will wear me down where it's just filling her up. I need to, to fill my soul. I need to find time alone, especially in the type of role that I have in the job. I, I need to withdraw and just spend time with my kids or read a book or spend time with God or whatever it is. And that's what feeds my soul. So it's understanding that what feeds someone's soul might not feed your soul, even if you enjoy doing it. And if you have an introverted personality type, uh, like phlegmatic or uh, melancholic in, in this example, then that's even more so. You've got to realise that it's uh, being with people is tiring and wears you down. And so you need to find things that will actually feed your soul. Top up your soul tank. Oh, I love... Uh, motorbike riding, okay? Oh, nothing better than getting on your bike, get some music in your ears, the sun shining, getting out on the highway and just relaxing. That feeds my soul. It fills me up. And so I make time to try and do that in my life. And Sarah understands that, you know, we put a huge priority on our family and we always will spend more time with them than anything else. But if I go for a ride on my bike, she knows it's filling up my soul tank. So I'll be a better father and a better husband and a better minister and all of that kind of stuff. And so we, we find things that we like to do together for Sarah and I, Sometimes watching movies, just chilling out, watching movies. I was going to say Netflix and chill, but that has a whole different connotation, okay? <laughs> She's been away for nine days. Anyway, okay. So, God help me. Uh, so, so, 
We like watching movies because, you know, we carry you in our hearts all the time. And so church is not like a nine to five job. We, we think about you constantly. We're talking about church. And so sometimes we find late at night, we're just sitting up talking about you and talking about the church. And so to shut down, we turn the TV on, watch a movie and just relax for a moment. That feeds our soul, realises that there's more to life than what we do. And so we do it together. Or as a family, we like getting out and about and going on adventures and walks or going to the lake or working around the house or whatever it is. Just find something that feeds your soul. And I know you think, oh, that sounds so simple. But if I went around and talked with each of you individually and privately, there'd be a huge number of people that could not answer the question of what is it that feeds your soul right now? And are you doing it? And how much time are you putting into that? Please, church, listen to me. Find something, get a revelation of what feeds your soul. Put some discipline in place in your calendar to make that happen and be consistent about it. And we will see our souls healthy for the long term. All right, is that okay? Heart. Number three is your heart. This is a big topic too. Church, we have to do better at protecting our hearts. We deal with so many people with broken hearts. Heart health equals soul health. Here's another three points for you. Number one for heart health, stay humble. Stay humble. You don't have to prove yourself to anybody else. You don't have to prove yourself to God. You don't have to push yourself forward in life. You don't have to try and get noticed in church life or otherwise. God is the one who will lift you up and exalt you. Stay humble above everything else. If you keep trying to promote yourself, it leads to pride. Stay humble, whatever it takes. In ministry life, humility goes a long way for me. I would give a platform or a position in church or ministry in church life to a humble person over a gifted person any day of the week. Because it's easier to teach a skill than it is to develop humility. Humility means that you are teachable. Church, listen to me. Teachability is is a skill that will get you a long way in life. Stay humble, you stay teachable. If you don't create a habit of humility, then God will have to humble you. Let me just say it's not much fun at all. So we get a revelation, how's our humility? Get a discipline and be consistent. Number two in our heart health, forgive quickly. Forgive quickly. It keeps your heart pure. Holding onto a grudge or a hurt or unforgiveness does not do your heart any good and ultimately your soul no good at all. Create a habit of forgiving quickly. Remove your right to be right. God is a just God. Trust Him to handle it for you and just forgive and move on. Keep your heart pure. Forgive quickly. Get a revelation of it. Some of you here today, you're holding on to a hurt. You're holding on to unforgiveness in a situation. You may be right. doesn't matter. Let it go. Forgive quickly and trust God to be the one to vindicate you. It'll help your heart and it'll ultimately help your soul. I believe God's speaking to people here this morning about that. Number three, keep a sweet spirit. Keep a sweet spirit. Don't harden your heart, church. Don't allow life or people or hurt or offence to harden your heart. Keeping a sweet spirit is actually a choice. We talk to our staff about this all the time because in church life, it's very easy to harden your heart or to get upset about things in in church life. Pastor Nick Klingenberg has this saying, it's very simple, it just is amen. And what he says it like this, amen. What he means is, is like, if there's a situation that's just too big and you just can't believe that this has happened, you can't fix it, it could be every opportunity to take offence at it or be hurt by it or whatever, it's just like, Amen. It's kind of like, let it go. It's all right. Keep a sweet spirit. It's okay. Just, just let it go. It, don't harden your heart over offence or hurt or grudges or, or mistreatment, anything. We could all find something to be offended or hurt by, right? To hold a grudge to. My prayer is that we would be a church that just lets it go. Yeah. Keep a sweet spirit beyond everything. It's a decision. It's a choice. Get a revelation of how your heart is this morning. Make a discipline around it to let it go. Keep a sweet spirit. You know that a hard heart becomes a cynical heart. And it's very hard for God to work with a cynical heart. Keep your heart soft and open to the things of God. Keep your heart soft and open to correction, which is never nice. 
and to growth. Keep it open for new relationships as well, ever widening our circle of influence and love in our heart. Keep it soft, keep it open, keep it teachable. Heart health equals soul health. (coughs) Keep a sweet spirit, church. Again, I believe the Holy Spirit is highlighting areas to people this morning about where your heart has become hard and where you just need to let it go. Doesn't matter if you're right or you're wrong, just let it go. Keep a sweet spirit. Don't become offended. Don't let your heart grow hard. So those are the three areas for our soul health, our marriage and our family, our hobbies and our heart. Church, if you can grab a hold of even one of those things and apply a what now principle to it today, put some things in place to create a habit, revelation, a discipline, consistency, then then I believe we'll be taking some great steps in becoming more like Christ. The last one, number three, healthy spiritual habits. Healthy spiritual habits. You know, developing a spiritual, uh, greater spiritual life is not actually that difficult. It's actually just like the body and the soul life. It's all about our habits for spiritual life. And how do we create habits? Revelation, discipline, consistency. You know that we're all equally saved. If you've said yes to Jesus, you've accepted His grace in your life and you've become a Christ follower, we're all equally saved. But, but here's a revelation for you. We're not all equally spiritual, okay? There are people who have a greater relationship with Jesus than you do. There are people that are walking in a greater anointing than you do. There are people who have, hear the voice of God more intimately than you do. There are people who operate in the gifts of the Spirit more than you do. There are people who have more fruit of the Spirit, like love and patience and all of that stuff than you do. We're not all equally spiritual, although we're equally saved. How do you become more spiritual? We look at people who have an amazing anointing on their life or they just seem to operate in this incredible sweetness of the fruit of the Spirit or they they can hear from God in incredible ways or have an amazing prayer life. We think, oh, that's so unattainable. How do they do that? How can I have that as well? Well, what I've come to realise is that it's not about some big massive event or some incredible incredible thing. It's about a revelation. It's about discipline and it's about consistency. A little habits over a long period of time builds greater spiritual life than what we have right now. And so a what now for all of us is how, what can we put in place now that will ensure that we are moving forward in our spiritual world in six months time, in a year's time, in five years time, because we don't want to be stuck, right, in the same place. We're all equally saved, but let's not camp there. Let's become more spiritual as we grow towards Christ. So let me just highlight a few examples of this. Some solid spiritual habits. Now there's not three of these, just by the way, it doesn't quite fit my message uh, structure, but I'm just going to list out some things very quickly this morning. A daily devotional. A daily devotional. If you don't have one, start one. That's your what now this morning. Intimacy, spending time with Jesus, putting a priority on Him will build your spiritual life. It's not rocket science, right? A daily reading of the Bible, learning His Word, putting a value on the Word of God in your life will set a massive priority for that. A daily prayer life. Pray without ceasing, the Bible says. Just pray regularly. You don't just pray all the time, just as though you're with Jesus in everything that you do. Just keep praying, keep talking to Him, keep doing that. It'll develop an amazing prayer life. That sort of the prayer life that you see other people have will be developed over a consistency pattern of habits of praying without ceasing. Keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it. Weekly church attendance. This is a major one in today's society. Make a commitment to be in church with your family every single week. It's so important. Sets a priority on the house of God, on worshipping Him. God honours that type of commitment. And so put a pattern in place, get a habit and put it in place. What about a hope group, a fortnightly hope group attendance? This is, hope groups is where connection, care and discipleship happen. So if you're not part of a hope group, you are missing out on a huge part of what church is supposed to be that you will never get from a Sunday service. It's, the Sunday services are not, are not designed for that type of stuff. It's where you get pastoral care, where you build relationships with people, where you have connection and discipleship all happen in a hope group. If you're not in a hope group, maybe that's your what now this morning. Go and sign up to be in a hope group or to lead a hope group group and get plugged in and connected to people who can help you on your spiritual journey. 
Here's another one. Regularly giving into the house of God. Develop a pattern of faithful giving into God's house. Set that as a priority in your life and be active. Keep faith alive in it. Stretch yourself. Allow God to challenge you in your giving if it becomes so routine that it's just easy as. Begin to trust Him again and go a bit further, stretch a bit more. Develop this pattern in your life of allowing God to grow you as a person and your capacity. Regularly serving in the house of God using the gifts that God has given you to honour Him and to build His house. It'll unlock something powerful in your life that'll set you up to grow spiritually. So simple stuff, right? But if you can do this, it's gonna change the course of your spiritual journey. Regular study, learn, 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 learn. Just keep learning. There's so many resources available to us these days. Just keep learning about God, learning about the things of God, reading the Bible, getting passages and commentaries and discovering hidden truths for yourself. It's not our responsibility to disciple you or train you in everything to do with the Bible. That can't happen on a Sunday, especially when I don't even open it like today, okay? Here's some, here's, Here's another one, regularly, a regular life of worship. Do you know that worship is the one thing that we're gonna do forever? So you might as well learn to do it good now, right? So just keep build, living a life of worship, corporate worship, private worship, worshiping with your finances, worshiping with your serving, worshiping in everything that you do, do it unto God and worship Him with your gifts. Amazing development of our spiritual life as we worship Him regularly. Here's a couple of commands from Jesus. Okay, be baptised. That's actually a biblical command. So if you haven't been water baptised, then there's a what now for you this morning. You need to sign up to be baptised the next baptism service we have. Honour God in obedience and He will do amazing things in your life. Take communion as a sacrament. That's the thing that we have to do regularly as we gather together. And so make a habit of taking communion. It resets us. It brings our focus back to the cross of Jesus Christ and the grace that we have. It stops us getting too arrogant or self-confident and trusting Him regularly. A life of discipleship, character development, a life of developing gifts of the fruit of the Spirit. Keep on growing, church. A life of becoming like Christ. Jesus is our ultimate example and He's our ultimate goal. And so if we can just keep taking steps up the staircase, growing towards Christ-likeness, we are gonna be more spiritual people. So to conclude this morning, I need to finish. That's my what now threes, okay? A message of threes. It's very practical, but I hope and I pray that God has used it to begin to challenge us all in some areas of our life. I I know that not one of us today who has heard this message can say, oh, nothing applies to me. Maybe, Maybe for you, most of it doesn't, but there's one or two things or five things or 10 things, whatever it is that you can say, hey, I need to apply this to my life. My body health, I I need to get a revelation of that. I need to get some discipline. My my soul health is not tracking well. I know where I'll end up in in a year's time or five years time. I need to get a revelation of my soul health and put some discipline and consistency. Or maybe it's your spiritual health. You've got a hunger to become more spiritual, to learn more of God, to develop a relationship with Him. It's, It's not a difficult thing to do. It's about doing the small things well and putting discipline and consistency in place. You, you will wake up in 12 months time on this day a completely different person if you take what I've shared with you and apply it to your life. If you don't, that's fine. It's your life. But you'll wake up the same spiritually, the same in your soul, and, and probably worse in your body. We can all apply something, right? I, I would love it if we all go on a journey, keep asking what now, and we wake up in 12 months time thinking, man, look how far I've come up this staircase in my spiritual journey. Wow, God, look how far I've come in my soul health. I'm a healthier person than I was 12 months ago. God, look how much healthier I am in my body now 12 months later by applying a few little principles and making some discipline and consistency in my life around my health. Church, we can do this. We can do this. I'm gonna pray in a moment and I'm gonna ask that the Holy Spirit would speak to you clearly about what things to take home and start applying to your life here this morning. Would you stand with me? Look, I don't really care, to be honest, what step you take. But what I care about is that you keep taking steps. We've got to keep moving, church. We're not, we're not here just to be stagnant and stale. 
The whole aim of this series is to get us asking this what now question. What now, what now, what now? Every time we fail, we say what now? Every time we're in a valley, we say what now? Every time we have a success, we say what now? God, what now? This is your prayer. Okay, this is your prayer. God, what now? God, what now? God, what now? God, what now? It's a simple prayer, but it'll change your life. Holy Spirit, I ask right now as we close this 11 a.m. service, Lord, we give You room to speak to every person in the building. Lord, let it not just be words of advice or practical things, but God, let it get in our spirit. Holy Spirit, I ask that You'd speak to every person about what it is, what, what now question they can ask about their body, their soul and their spirit. Lord, give us all a revelation in these areas. Help us to be disciplined in these areas and to build consistency in what we're doing. Just allow Holy Spirit to speak to you. I'm gonna pause for 30 seconds. Let Him drop some thoughts in your heart that you can apply this week. God, we thank You for this series, powerful time of journeying together as a church. And I pray that You will continue to help us to never forget this question, what now? Lord, for the, the words that You've spoken to people here this morning, God, I pray You'll give us the boldness, the confidence, the fortitude to put some discipline in place and to be consistent in it, to see life changed for the better. God, we wanna be better people in our bodies, in our soul and our spirit. Lord, we speak that over every life here this morning, every family, every situation. In the Name of Jesus, we declare. Jesus, we give You all the honour and all the glory. Lord, help us to continue to walk and to step and to keep asking what now questions to become more and more and more like You. Jesus, we love You and we honour You in this house. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you, church. Thanks for being in church today. We love it when you turn up. That's awesome. Congratulations. Go and hang out in the cafe. If you're visiting, we'd love to connect with you. Go and grab a free coffee. And uh, Thanks for joining us for this message. For more information about our church, head along to www.hopechapel.nz. See you next time.